The final set of decisions I want to talk about happen at about 1,800 hours, and they are under the purview of these two men, Frank Jack Fletcher, who is the overall commander of the, uh, the American Carrier Forces, and his subordinate, Raymond Spruance. Now, these two gentlemen have known each other a very long time. They were both a year apart at the Naval Academy. They are both products of the, the Naval War College, of course. Um, in the not too distant past, Fletcher was the commander of Cruiser Scouting Forces Pacific, and Spruance was one of his cruiser division commanders. So these are two guys that have known each other a very long time. They have worked together for many years. They've undoubtedly socialized uh, quite a bit. And Fletcher doesn't know a whole lot about Spruance as a carrier commander, but he knows that, that Spruance has three things that, that recommend him. First, um, Spruance had a very fine reputation while he was at the War College as being a very good strategist. Second, Spruance comes into this battle with the glowing recommendation of, of Admiral William Halsey. Halsey says explicitly, I will not trust my carriers to any other man except my cruiser screen commander, Raymond Spruance. That's a pretty serious endorsement. And Fletcher also knows that Spruance has inherited uh, Halsey's complete staff, which is very well thought of. And, you know, thus far, it seems like he's run the battle pretty darned well. At this point in time, we know that we've set four Japanese aircraft carriers uh, on fire, and, and you know, things are amazingly going relatively well for us. And this is a good thing for Fletcher, because at this point, Fletcher doesn't really have a carrier anymore. Uh, the Yorktown has been put out of business, finally, uh, by Hashimoto's uh, afternoon torpedo attack. She's been abandoned. Um, Fletcher has had to transfer his flag to the Astoria and he briefly mulls with uh, the notion of, well, maybe I will sail over to Task Force 16 and I will hoist my flag aboard the Hornet. But the more he considers that, there are a couple of things that, that militate against that. The first being that he's a good ways away, 30 to 40 miles from Task Force 16 at this point. It's going to take a number of hours to get over there. And he also kind of worries about upsetting the apple cart. Things are going OK. Um, Spruance has got a good staff. So when Spruance very diligently uh, radios Fletcher about this time and asks his superior for instructions as to how he would like him to continue fighting the battle, Fletcher very selflessly radios back and says, I have none, and I will conform to your movements. In other words, you're in charge, sir. Take the ball and, and run with it. So the thing that Spruance has got to wrestle with at this point is, what am I going to do this evening? My intelligence reports tell me I've got four carriers on fire, but you know, I've really got two options here at hand. One is the aggressive option, and then there's the not-so-aggressive option. The aggressive option says, I've got a beaten enemy that is starting to retreat to the northwest. I am going to drive my forces aggressively to the west all this evening and be in a position tomorrow morning that I can give them the maximum hurt as soon as the sun rises. The not-so-aggressive approach says, well, there could be a fifth Japanese carrier out there. The intelligence reports have said there may be as many as five. And the last thing I heard from this general neck of the woods is a flight of American B-17s got jumped by some zeros when they were attacking the Hiryu up here. Could there be another, American, or another Japanese carrier out there? I don't know. Furthermore, there are uh, invasion forces of the Japanese down in this neck of the woods that last I know are continuing to approach Midway. And finally, I have no idea whether or not the Japanese uh, surface forces from Kido Butai are going to come looking for me this evening. And Fletcher and Spruance both have a very healthy appreciation for Japanese surface uh, warfare capabilities. They have no interest in running to any of these gentlemen uh, at O-Dark 30 because they know that 20 or 30 minutes underneath you know, some battleship guns could completely reverse the outcome of this battle. And that really is the tipping point as far as Spruance is concerned. He's been given very clear instructions from Admiral Nimitz that you are not to expose your carrier forces unless you feel that they are in a position to deliver disproportionate uh, damage to the enemy uh, in comparison to the risk that you'll face in exposing those forces. Well, running into a night battle is the exact opposite of that. You now have the ability to potentially throw away everything that you have worked for all day long for very little in the way of real gains. So 
Spruance decides that uh, discretion is the better part of valor, and what he is going to do is he is going to actually uh, move his forces off to the east until midnight, and then he will turn north for a bit, and only then will he begin uh, moving back uh, towards the west. So he'll be in a position the following morning um, to protect Midway. And at that point, Spruance goes to bed. Spruance goes to bed. Which, if ever the phrase, you know, ice water in the veins applied to a man, I mean, here you know that the Japanese may, in fact, be gunning for you this evening. In fact, they were. But he reasons that, well, you know, I've got to be fresh for tomorrow because tomorrow is a new day and likely going to be a very busy day. And when asked years later about, you know, how he could possibly turn in at this juncture of the battle, he, he responded, I had good officers with me. They knew their jobs. They would carry on. Why should I not sleep soundly? So here was a subordinate who likewise understood the value of his own subordinates and was willing to place his command, the battle, uh, perhaps his life in the hands of these men, knowing that they were good officers and they would carry on and that everything would be okay. So I understand that this is an extremely uh, busy week here at the Naval War College, and I was disagreeably surprised to discover that there is going to be no reception after uh, this event. So unfortunately, I will not be able to meet any of you or many of you after the event. But I would ask you, as you go on to your new assignments and you're moving your houses and doing all the craziness that's going to happen here in the next few days, that if you have an opportunity to raise your uh, refreshing beverage of your choice, that you remember to salute three things. And the first of those is the value of minions, good minions. Because you never know which one of those men or women is going to come to you with the right stuff at the right time and potentially bail you out of a horrible situation, save you from being the goat, maybe turn you into a hero. And it may be because of their superior knowledge of a weapon system or their superior knowledge of a facet of doctrine that you may have overlooked, or their superior knowledge of the theater of operations that you now find yourself in. Or it may be that you've just got someone on your hands like a Dick Best, who is just a world-class warrior, and at some innate level, they just get it, and they've got the skills and the moxie to just bring it when it needs to be brought. You know, let us celebrate those people. Let us cherish those people. Let us encourage those people. And much like Admiral Fletcher, let us have, when called upon, the selflessness and the lack of ego to just get the heck out of their way and let them do their thing. So that's the first thing I would raise my glass to. The second, of course, is, is the Naval War College. And you know, we are celebrating here the 125th anniversary of the founding of the War College. It is the War College and the instructing that, that happened here in the late 20s and 30s that created the common framework of strategic and operational thought within which admirals like Nimitz and Fletcher and Spruance operated. And I'm absolutely convinced that we had an advantage at the higher levels of command during this battle that was crucial to its outcome. Yes, we got very, very lucky at the Battle of Midway. There's no question of that. Yes, we also benefited from splendid tactical level leadership from people like McCluskey and Best and, and Leslie and, and a whole host of others. But we also had an advantage at the higher levels in, in people like Nimitz who were able to conceive of a way to create a battle wherein we could position our outnumbered forces in such a way that they could actually do disproportionate damage to the enemy and, and win that battle for us. And so the Naval uh, War College certainly comes in for its share of, of uh, applause for that. The third thing, of course, that I would ask you to remember are the men of the United States Navy, the United States Marine Corps, and the United States Army Air Force whose intelligence and bravery and skill and sacrifice won for us 68 years ago today uh, the seminal naval victory that we commemorate. May their sacrifices and their spirit not be forgotten. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, sir.